You know, how did you, what was your entree into being a DJ? And you can start as far back as you would like. <laughs> well, no, since, I mean, I was always really into music. I was like, when I was a little kid, I would, I was like that little kid that's like, want to videotape me singing a song? Like I had like my microphone. So I always thought I wanted to be a singer and, you know, it started to grow up. I was like, oh, how realistic is that? But I was trained, um, trained as a singer, but I kind of went off, went off the path. I went to film school right before film school. I had gone off to Europe to travel for two months before I went to college. And while I was there, that was really the beginning of me hearing like electronic music. It was like total crazy, like trance music with lasers. And I was just like 17 years old in Europe. Like what is this and um so i kind of like stayed in that scene like i would always go to i worked the i went to film school i worked in a coat check at a club in boston where i was going to school i would go to all the shows i came out to la i started working as an editor and i was mostly just like the person in the crowd that liked the, to dance i still was kind of like hey you want to watch me do a dance like i'll be right up in the front row that was always me and uh one day, I think it was 2003, I went to go see a show and the DJ that was playing, him and another guy were up on the stage and they were talking and the guy picked up the record that the DJ was gonna play, threw it into the crowd. And this is where I would love to say, it. and then I caught it. And sometimes I say that to people just to like shorten the story, like, but actually the guy next to me caught the record, but he looked at the record and he's like, what's this? And I just said, oh, I'll take it. And he said, here, and he just gave me the record. And I ran down the street. My friends were having um, an event at a club that was down the street from the club that I was at. And if someone did this to me today, I would be so annoyed. It's so funny because I ran up to my friend and I'm like, will you play this record? And it was the end of the night anyways, because I was like, I wanted to hear the record. And in that moment, I just had this like, youthful it's a sign i'm supposed to learn to dj <laughs> and uh, after that i would like go to my friend's house every tuesday and we would he had like a mixer that we could both have headphones on so he would listen as i was djing as i would take the two records and try to learn to beat match them and it's really like six months of being awful at something and really trying to like push through it like not even beat matching one record and that was sort of that was sort of the beginning of just how it all started. So for a long time, it was just like me at my house. And one day I just had a friend that's like, you're gonna come play at my club. And I was like, me, I'm not really that good. And he's like, no, you're coming. And that was sort of the moment that first time that I played in front of people, it was at like Kohl's, which is an old, um, it's redone as this like hipster bar in Delhi. But back then it was like really just like the oldest like pastrami shop in LA, I think it was like a hundred years old. I like played next to, like a deli full of like lunch meats and stuff. <laughs> um, but, but it was my first time playing in front of people. And after that, I just really enjoyed, I enjoyed that experience of like, it's a different sort of way of relating to people of like seeing what they like and kind of feeling into what to play next. And I loved, I loved that experience. So after that, I was sort of hooked. <laughs> Would you say that that was either the catching of the record or the first DJ experience, like what you would call your first DJ experience when you realized that this was your thing? I mean, I would say it would be that. The catching of the record, I was more of just like, it was like a little spark, but I didn't really know what that meant. But it was that moment, that moment of playing in this deli in downtown LA. It was, it was more the moment of doing something interesting with the music and then seeing the people respond to it and then being able to create this sort of silent communication like we weren't talking to each other but it was something i hadn't really had that exact experience before of just being like oh i can like really feeling the emotions of the people like on the dance floor and then that sort of guiding me on my next decision and that's that's one thing that i really enjoy with djing are these moments where you like really tap into 
when you really tap into the crowd and the crowd is tapped into you it's it really is like a reciprocal relationship of where you're speaking to each other without words through music and just like i feel it in my whole body like my hands become these like guides like i guess i'm going to play this next um it's a really it's it's really different than anything else that I have done in my life. And I, that was the part I enjoyed the most with that, this, these like moments of connection with people and really being like, okay, well, what, this is what I'm feeling. And so what am I going to kind of give back? This is what you're giving me. Where am I going to go with that? And how do I create a story out of that relationship with the dance floor? That's interesting. You know, I've heard mixing being referred to as like an energy exchange before, but I haven't, the creating of the story kind of takes it a step further, almost. Is it different? Do you find that it changes based on location or um, like what change? What changes that story? It it definitely changes. I mean, there are a lot of things that kind of play into it because I would say location. I mean, now because I travel a lot, I do know like certain cities that I go to, there is a different vibe and I'll notice myself picking different music. But also I would say like time, the time that you're playing. Because for instance, if I go to like Burning Man and I play at Sunrise, that's a totally different um, feeling of different place that I'm in, a different place that the crowd's in, a different place like you're looking at the sunrise over the desert. So it's a total different choice of music that comes out than if I'm like at a club and playing at midnight or 1 a.m. or if you're like the opening set like the opening set a lot of people talk about it's so difficult because you're really you're curating the music from this moment of no one being on the dance floor like how do I ease people in so each of those call for something from for something different and I I like having that because I feel like then I can choose I have there's so much music that I really love and there's probably music that I'm more known for and the music that I make all of that but then there are moments where you know i can go off like i did um for sunrise on a live stream for instance on new year's day i did like a disco set which was just fun to go into all those because i'm not playing those at two o'clock in the morning at the club you know <laughs> yeah what music would you say you're known for i would say that people kind of this like funky bouncy tech tech house so like a blend of house uh kind of banging these are all the words that people tell me. Those are the things that I'm more known for. And I like the funky Jack and house scene and like tech house sound would be the ones that I think most people kind of associate with me. Gotcha. Looking back on your, your sort of like life transition from not a DJ to what you would have called a DJ. Do you feel like there was a process or a thought process that you went through to come to that realization or make that decision for yourself and what did that look like or was it more kind of organic? I think it was definitely an organic progression of just like loving music, playing music. I have a personality type that if I start doing something, it's very difficult for me to like not really just go deep into it. So even from those first moments of just learning to like beat match, like there was no like, oh, I'm gonna do this. Like the worse I was at it, the more I was like, I will know how to do this. These records will not beat me. And so it was kind of like doing that, the enjoyment, like getting into the craft kind of developed into um, then playing at parties. And even then when I would just play at parties, it wasn't necessarily like I thought of myself as a DJ. I think, I mean, at this point, it's probably like seven or eight years ago when I when I kind of like I'd stop I'd started playing at clubs or I started playing at events but then I also started to get asked to travel to different places and I think that that is more of when I started to think of myself like as a DJ like I'm not a video editor and also sometimes I DJ as a hobby they became like more doing it the same amount and then it was in 2013 I think yeah is when i I quit my regular day job because I was traveling so much and I, I still would freelance, but I, I then was able to travel and go all around the country and DJ and things like that. And I think that that's really when that came more to the front. And when people ask me what I do, that became a thing that I would say that I did. So it was it was organic, but it really grew out of it really grew out of like the time when it was taking a certain amount of time and I was traveling and I was like, oh, they're like people actually like 
paying me to go to other places that I've never been before to be there. I guess this is a thing that I do and it's not just me in my living room. Clearly. So yeah. like <laughs> you just woke up one day and were like, yep, I'm a DJ. Yep. This is my thing. Yeah. <laughs> This is, this is my thing. It sort of was like that. You know, I'm really thankful to, you know, I feel like I had started going to Burning Man and Burning Man could be so like out there and there's all these artists and things like that. And I don't think had I not had that kind of like side thing going on, like there's a lot of things that I could complain about with Burning Man too. But one thing I will be very thankful for is I feel like having that as a place that I went and all these artists and different musicians that spent their year prepping for that, it was, it kind of opened my eyes to the idea that like, oh, I could make my life being an artist. I don't think it had I not had that, that I would have been like, I'm going to quit my day job um, and go do this other thing for half the time or more than half, you know, go do and put my all into this and start making, I just, I don't think that would have crossed my mind, but because I had met so many artists and people that made their living doing that, it was really inspirational to me too. So I guess that brings me to my next question, which is um, were there particular figures in that journey that you looked up to or people who inspired you or encouraged you on that journey? Um, and what kinds of people were they? How did you cross paths with them? What did that look like? There are, uh, were a lot of people. I think, you know, one of the reasons that I didn't really at first, even even when I was kind of learning that I didn't even really consider it is that there weren't like actually a lot of other females DJing that were like at big shows or on stages. I mean, that was like the early 2000s, mid 2000s. And I went to, there was a club in Los Angeles. I live in Oakland now, but I lived in LA for like 20 years. I went to a show one night that had, um, DJ Heather from Chicago and Colette, who's in LA. I don't know. I think she was also from Chicago. She's in LA now. And I saw the two of them DJ together. And I feel like I didn't know either of them personally, but I had already been sort of learning to DJ and to see them at what was, is pretty much a pretty legendary club in LA and to see them really like holding the crowd in the way that they did and commanding the crowd in the way they did. Colette would like sing as well. I think that that in its small way, like really kind of like opened my eyes a little bit like, oh, you know, and I, I will admit, like, again, I am sort of like a natural performer. Like I always was like, like I was saying, I always like to get up and do that kind of stuff. So I was like, oh, yeah, I can also like get up on stage, which I already know that I like doing. I'm embarrassed to say um, and really like command more of an audience. You know, and that that was like another very inspirational moment that kind of made me start to like think to like dig deeper and think that there was more opportunity there. Um, gosh, I don't even remember when we met. My mentor has been a DJ named DJ Dan, who kind of like really like took me on and in a world where a lot of like I actually felt like it was really difficult to walk into spaces with men or I always felt like there was a lot of competition with men to meet DJ Dan and then he like took me on and would just be like who are you we need to meet you're an amazing DJ and then really push me to make music and all of that he was like a really big teacher and again I don't know that I would have been able to do what I did had I not him had him behind me really like um supporting me in a way that I really hadn't had anyone else do I had a you know I had friends that would show up and I had friends that were like oh you're a great DJ but to someone to really stand behind me and say not only are you a great DJ but I also really believe in you um, really again up leveled and started to change my mindset and I run his record label now we like work talk every week and work together and curate music and things like that and you know I always tell him so thankful for that because I think that I dealt with a lot of insecurity for a long time because I would just walk into spaces and I wouldn't necessarily always feel comfortable or I would always feel like there was some people would say things like, oh, you're my favorite girl DJ or you're really good for a female DJ. And so I wasn't really used to someone just stepping in and saying, no, you're really, really good. I feel eternally grateful for that relationship too. Those are everything, <laughs> aren't they? Yeah. <laughs> like I, I, yes. I hear that for sure. Um, I want to dig a little bit into the last thing you said, um, especially like, so what I heard was you're great for a female DJ. 
So let's talk about that a little bit because my next question was, you know, what's your experience been like doing work in an area that, you know, traditionally, at least from the outside, seems like a much of a more male dominated area? I mean, I will say I see a change in that there's many more female DJs now, like so, so many more um, now. That being said, in general, when I look at the just like dance music, which covers a lot of genres, like so there's there's ones where it might be more so or less so. But I think in general, overall, many of the females I talk to still experience a lot of the same things that um, I was experiencing even when I first began. And I still have people say, I you're my favorite female DJ. I'm not exactly sure why they feel the need to classify it. You know, I used to always have this joke because people would be like, oh, you're so good for a female. I'm like, oh, yes, my tiny little woman brain can like run all of this technology and push all these buttons. Oh. Um, and I understood that people really, really thought that they were giving me a compliment. And I understand that from them it was a compliment and that a lot of the people that were saying that were dudes that much like you said were in places where they just never there were no other females showing up um and you know unfortunately the thought that people would then have would be like oh there's a female she must be someone's girlfriend or she's sleeping with the promoter and honestly that is one thing that i have seen change now but really for 15 years of being a dj that i just heard people constantly say oh well she got booked because she was sleeping with the promoter or because he wants to sleep with her and just really derogatory uh things that people would say and i don't think people really thought it through and a lot of people men in particular thought something was being taken away from them like this woman is just on the lineup because she has this other thing that has nothing to do with the actual music. And I just think a lot of that grew out of just the culture that all of us live in, that we're only looking at and dismantling now, you know, um, that people, when they start to think about what they were saying, that people are looking a little deeper into the what they were kind of alluding to. Um, I used to run into a lot of pushback, even with events that I organized, because I started organizing events um, you know, I'd run into pushback from females and males about either having all, uh, all female lineups. Like some females were like, well, I don't want to be a part of an all female lineup because then I feel like the music isn't being isn't what's being being put out first. And I would have events where I would attempt to, you know, I'd say we'd always need to have a female on the lineup. And I would get a lot of pushback again from people saying, well, then you're not focusing on the music. Uh, and always what I would say is, okay, but we're focusing on the music and you're telling me we can't even find one female that we think is up to par with the rest of these men. I just think that that means we're not looking. We're not making the effort. It's not about taking anything away from anyone else. It's about putting the effort in to make sure that we're like looking at the whole picture, you know, and that applies to everyone, not just females, people of color. I feel like everybody's like reevaluating th this now um, because of the last year and because of everything from Me Too, people are much, much more open to to looking at that, to looking at their lineups, to looking at the events that they're putting together and questioning things that they wouldn't have questioned before. So that is a big change because I don't know if people still feel the way that they felt before, but they've kind of got on board with it's not as okay to just be like, oh, we're only focusing on the music and because of that, for some reason, there's no females here. Um, I think just having more females in the game out there DJing, organizing events and things like that. Obviously, we have experienced the world in a certain way. So the more of us that are out there that are playing, that are organizing events, that are just naturally aware that we have a different lens that we're putting on the, the world, the more of us that they are, we start bringing more people up with us. And it feels much more natural to like, uh, help other women up, mentor other women, put them on lineups. Um, it's still a struggle and it's a struggle. A friend of mine pointed out to me recently because I had, for the record label that I work for, I had put out a call and like one of my goals is I want to have more women on the record label. And so if you're having trouble finishing, like I know for a lot of women, they're afraid to ask or they feel a lot of judgment when they ask for help. And so I really wanted to put out there that I'm 
I'm happy to help, even if it's just about finishing a track. What do you need to do to, to finish this track? Whether it's a technical question, whether it's a question about promotion, what are the ways that I can kind of help? Um, I'm putting myself out there. And, you know, it's still like I did get some people that came, but just really getting how to spread the word and get other people to spread the word. You know, I still struggled finding people. And another friend brought up to me as well, like, you know, even sometimes for some people, having an actual computer becomes a wall, you know, to be able to do the work. How, so I'm still struggling with all these things. They're still in my mind, how can I do better? Um, but I think the, the conversation is out there and that's the biggest change because before, I would say anything before like 2015, I would get pushback from people that, you know, I was focusing on the wrong thing um, or that, you know, or just a lot of pushback People just didn't have as many problems making comments about, well, she's only here for this reason. And, you know, honestly, myself as a female, a lot of it's internalized. So I really had to catch myself and look at the way that I was thinking about other female DJs. And like, am I being like more in competition with other female DJs as opposed to like us just all trying to help each other? So I think there's just more that's come to the conscious forefront now. Um, you know, I still think there could be so many more females on lineups and, you know, being released, like I said, on our label. I've seen people make small changes and I think it needs to be much more than it is. But I definitely see things going in a different direction where even five years ago it didn't seem like a possibility. Like I always felt like uncomfortable when I didn't laugh along with like the derogatory jokes and things like that, you know, um, or people would say like you don't, you know you don't you just don't have a sense of humor that kind of stuff. I don't think people feel okay saying that anymore. I just heard you say even five years ago, so this is yeah. like a really new shift. Yeah, I think you saw more females over the last like I've been DJing like eighteen years something like that, and so I gradually saw more and more females DJing, which was good. But what I I felt like I didn't see was the conversations other people were having about those female DJs changed. Like I still would hear lots of comments and still, I mean, a lots of comments like uh, being about the D female DJs bodies and things like that. Lots of comments about like, Oh, the promoter is just doing that because he wants to get in her pants. Like people didn't have problems saying that stuff for a long time for longer than I, you know, feel like is even appropriate. I really feel like now has really been when you've started to see the major change and started to see, you know, I've always thought that in like the festival scene, which is something that I'm a part of, that even now there's not enough females on stage. And a thing that's coming up a lot right now is sexual assaults and things like that within fe festival culture. And I think the only way that you're going to see big changes in that is by seeing more females in positions of power, because if not, the only thing that's being sold to females is really objectifying them and about the way that they look. And saying things like that, I've really like only started to get different feedback from people more recently, unfortunately. Do you think it's... And I thought that the entire time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, do you think that some of the shift that you've seen recently is related to the pushback due to Me Too and other things where that sort of commentary <laughs> might have been acceptable before because it's presumed to be innocent? But then later it began to be linked to additional poor behavior related to things like sexual assault or domestic violence or something of that nature. Yeah, I mean, I think that the whole conversation that came up around Me Too and the way that that's then expanded out into all different areas of life and different, um, yeah, different places, it has really changed a lot. I think people were talking about it before. I just think when you're just talking to your normal everyday person or like it just wasn't as in the mainstream to have a conversation about. Um, and I think that what also happened around the same time is that more and more females have been DJing. So it it's kind of is all lined up. There was a little bit of a tipping point that there is just more females, like many more females than when I started. So of course we're naturally gonna have those conversations because we were used to dealing with all those things for so long. So when there's more of us that are in the different scenes to talk about it, it naturally comes up. And then that kind of coincided with the Me Too movement. 
And so then a lot more people saw it. And then a lot more people saw behavior that I think people excuse that even some of us or our parents, you know, that we kind of excused or laughed off. And then we, when we could suddenly see it on this large scale, we're like, oh no, everybody's going through it. And they all feel just as uncomfortable as I did. Because I definitely think like the time pe period that I grew up in, a lot of it was like written off as like, well, that's just the way men act laugh it off or you don't have a sense of humor that was a lot of i feel like coming out of being like a kid of the 80s you know even in just the media that we took in it was in all of that a lot of the jokes were men just being totally offensive you know so yeah i think all of that has kind of like come together and just a wider conversation opened up about it fascinating that's my take on it at least just out of curiosity, so this tipping point that you talked about where there's more and more women becoming female DJs, do you think that that has been kind of a snowball effect where one or two folks like you sort of stepped into it and just worked to create change? So then that next wave that came in saw you all as role, model, role models or saw you there doing your thing, being successful, thought that created a space for them or do you think it was for a different reason? I mean, I hope that that's why, because I feel like that's that's been one of, even in the moments where I felt like I've it been in dark places, where I didn't get the gigs that I wanted, or I felt like I was treated unfairly, I feel like one of my big motivating factors was always like, was so that other people felt comfortable doing it. Because for me, looking back on that night, seeing DJ Heather and Colette, was really, really inspiring and really important to me. And another DJ like Sandra Collins, who I feel like she was really like the first name I would hear from people before anyone else, just to see them made a difference for me and made a difference with the choices that I made and about how confident I felt. And for a long time, I really just felt like I just need to show up. And not only do I need to be a good DJ, I actually because I'm a female and because I hear all of this BS all the time, I feel like I have to walk in and I have to not only be a good DJ, I have to actually be the best one in the room. So I have to like, it made me better, but it definitely like took a lot out of me. And a lot of the reason that I push forward is because I did feel like, you know, I know that DJing isn't brain surgery and sometimes I don't feel like I'm out saving the world, but it's like the way I described it to a friend, it is the place that I found myself where I have some position of power for some reason. And in this place, making a change here, I believe feeds into the wider change because we need it to be across everything, you know, across, across all careers, across all things we need it to be. And this is just where I have happened to end up because of my crazy life for whatever reason. And, you know, there were times that I felt bad or I felt like I didn't want to do it and I really still wanted to show up and be and create a space like I feel really really strongly about creating it that's why even before I felt strongly of like having females on the lineup was always important to be aware of um, you know and I was lucky because I found myself in a position of power where I had a lot of naysayers but in the end I was the boss so I just did it you know hey <laughs> so whatever gets the job done <laughs> Exactly. And, I mean, you know, I know that not everybody finds themselves in that position. Yeah. So I got to work with what I hey. got. And I love, <laughs> I mean, I love hearing that. Um, I relate to that on a lot of levels where, you know, maybe we're not out saving the world as doctors or in the military or something from that perspective, but we're, we're creating space for others in all these different areas for for people to just truly be themselves in the best way that they know how and that is in my opinion a lot more courageous than the alternative exactly um what important lessons have you learned from this journey that you wish you'd known when you started and i'll finish the rest of my question and then if you want to answer them separately you're welcome to or you can fold them in so what important lessons have you learned that you wish you'd known when you started? And that could be anything. Um, or what would you want to share with other women based on those lessons in becoming a DJ, being a successful DJ, doing what you love, all of those things? I mean, the one thing I wish, like, 
I feel safe being more vocal about things now because of everything that's happened in the last few years. So I wish that I had been more vocal. There were a lot of things that I did that I don't know if in secret is the right way, but I, I would make decisions and I would do things and I would do them because I felt that it would help myself and other females, but I wasn't necessarily that vocal about it because I was afraid to speak up. And that is one thing that I would change. Like I feel myself actually beginning to feel emotional about it. But because of the time, I think that when I was, how I grew up, um, and just like being a female, kind of society tells you to stay quiet or to, you know, you're not meant to like speak up. So you're kind of like meant to know your place. And I'm really proud of a lot of the younger kids nowadays because I really see a lot of them like having a voice that I didn't necessarily feel like I could have. You know, I'm 43 now, so I'm like really dating myself, but like I- Right there with you. Growing up in the 80s, yeah. So <laughs> yep. I didn't feel like I had a voice and I feel like I have much more of a voice now. And I think for me, looking back, I just wish I spoke up about things earlier, but I was really afraid that it would, it would, that I would suffer because of it, because of it, that I wouldn't get DJ gigs. I told someone recently, like for a while, I really wanted to go through like all festivals that were happening and just literally count like how many female DJs there were, if they were in headlining positions, things like that. And, you know, I didn't do that because I was afraid of what the backlash would be of something like that. Um, you know, and I had already gone through an experience where somebody had disliked me and then said a lot of things about me and that prevented me from getting gigs. So I lived really in this fear based kind of state of how much I could say, like I felt like I could get a lot more done. Just I was like through my actions, through being who I am, that's what I'm going to do as opposed to like really speaking up. And I really feel like I've gotten more of a voice now. Like I love talking about this kind of stuff. and. I think looking back, I wish that I had had that kind of confidence that that to really speak up about it because I feel so strongly about it that, you know, I wish I had felt like I could be more open about it when I was younger. Uh, but I was I was really afraid and I, I, you know, living a little bit more and like how is what I'm going to say affect, you know, how far I can go um, and what other people think about me. And if I could tell my younger self, I would just be like, you know, F all of them <laughs> and just say what you need to say and, you know, don't hold back as much because I think there was a lot of holding back, even holding back in like where I like positioned myself in lineups. Even sometimes when I was in charge, I was so worried about other people, how they were going to take it or if they were going to feel like their ego was bruised in some way. And I really felt myself kind of like tiptoeing around in ways that we we're kind of taught sometimes that we need to take the back burner. And I would just, yeah. I feel like I wish I had found my voice like a little bit earlier or I could have felt more confident in it. I give myself the confidence to do that. Cheers to that. I mean, <laughs> I, so I'm, I'm 41, so I'm right there with you. Um, you know, I've been doing a lot of the same thing lately, kind of looking back and thinking, okay, where did I learn those lessons that said, stay quiet, don't rock the boat. Um, and, you know, I think some percent of it comes from family, cultural upbringing, that type of thing. Um, but yeah, I mean, looking at folks today, there's a huge, huge difference. And I also see people from our generation still doing that. I mean, I still catch myself doing it. So we're literally, we were trained to live that way. And it's, it takes a lot of personal work, I think, to get to a point where you're so self-aware that you catch yourself and make that change in every moment, you know, like it's when you've spent that much time in your life being trained to behave that way, it's, it's very difficult. So it's hard to undo. I, you know, and there were just so many things that like, there were so many times that I feel like I felt uncomfortable in certain situations where somebody made a joke or they made a comment about someone else or they said to me I was like so good for a girl all these times that I felt uncomfortable and I'm not saying like at every single time I needed to like burst out into like a debate or a you know go into it but you know the amount of times that I did just suck it up and laugh with them or you know I didn't say anything like I just hid any sort of internal emotion or feeling I was having about it that it was, I, I feel like it was detrimental to just myself when you're constantly trying to keep so much inside and not speak up. Like, 
there is a joke. I love this joke in one of like Amy Schumer's stand ups where she's talking about millennials and me too, where she's like, the millennials are all like, have have they been doing this this whole time? Have been men been treating you like this at work this whole time? And she's like, uh, yes. And I was like, oh my God. I just cracked up because I was like, that's exactly how I feel. And like, yes, it's been like this the whole time. And yes, there were so many times that I felt like it was an inappropriate or uncomfortable. And yeah, I didn't speak up. I do, I have this one story where this guy came up in the DJ booth with me and he had a shake weight with him. You know, it's a yeah. it's that you shake. And the DJ booth was really high. So I'm in the DJ booth and the DJ booth's up here. So people are really kind of seeing from here up. And he stood next to me with the shake weight, shaking it like he was jacking off on me. And I was trying to like get someone's attention just to come back to like very, like keep DJing, just like try to like wave someone over so no one sees that you're upset. And I just looked back and I was like, there was literally a guy standing next to me while I was performing in front of people pretending to jack off and I didn't yell and scream and say, get the, you know, I was like trying to like wave someone over and I was trying not to like bring a lot of attention to him. He was like a DJ from another scene that was pretty well known. And I was just like, all this stuff was like about not causing a scene. And I think that like now I look back at that, at that on such like a moment where I just am really like, I don't know if I'm ashamed of myself, but really disappointed in the way that that went down in that moment. And just like, I've had to do a lot of like internal reflection and uh, look back on a lot of things and look at them differently and catch myself. Where am I doing that again? When am I just like trying to like keep the peace, you know? Right. Wow. I, I, you describing that of course took me to moments that I had where the immediate thought is keep the peace. Don't upset everyone. Make it okay. All this kind of stuff. Yeah. There was a lot of make it okay. Like don't, yeah. Don't upset anyone. Just got it. Is there anything that you would change about the way you got to where you are now, the process, anything that we haven't already covered kind of in lessons? You know, I think for me, the way that I did it, I'm happy with, like I said, the the main thing I would go back and give myself like a little bit more confidence. Like I always like kind of, I did let like, like as I was learning and stuff, I kind of always defaulted to the men that knew all the technical stuff. And it really took me a long time to get past the like, I am actually very good at technical things. I mean, I was a video editor for 20 years. Like I'm like, I can install, I set up my live stream, I could do all this stuff. But for some reason, when I was starting, I was just like, oh, I'm not supposed to be like so technically oriented. Like I can just be like, oh, show me what to do. It was just, I mean, that was in my 20s and I just look back and kind of like facepalm myself. But I just think that like if it's just picking it up and learning to do it. I mean, I'm really proud of myself. I mean, nowadays people learn with USBs. They can learn with their computer. You learn with the CDJs. I mean, if somebody came to me, I could probably have the beat matching in an hour. When I learned on vinyl, this was like six months till I beat matched my first record. <laughs> so it took a long time just to get past that aspect of it and i feel like that's the thing that is not necessarily there anymore um, but i'm really proud of that time that i took like i couldn't just jump on and be like today i have a dj i really had to go through this like process of really learning and i do think like with all the music and all the technology out there sometimes people can just jump in and be like oh i'm a dj now but really like taking that time to like get to know the music and what's your style like I really loved house music but there's so many types of music and so many types of DJs that there are out there that all involve like a different way of like telling a story we were talking about storytelling earlier a way that you tell the story and really like learning that dependent on the type of music like in house music people really they don't want the beat to ever stop like they don't usually like MCs getting on the microphone as much. Like a lot of times it's really about going on a journey with the DJ and how that story gets told with these long mixes where you can't even tell that the next track is coming in. But you might be playing another type of music. You know, in hip hop, so much of it is about turntablism. I can't do that. I can't scratch. And it's an amazing talent that people have. So I think, you know, depending on the type of music that you really like, going into the history of that learning about where it came from. That's one thing that 
DJ Dan and I talk about a lot. Like a lot of the music that's on the label are like funk and disco remixes. And we talk a lot about wanting, how do we represent more people on this? Especially when this is a genre of music that came out of gay and black discotheques. Like we don't want to just take that music and have made it our own. So we need to make sure, you know, how do we bring in artists that are also representing where a lot of this music grew out of? And so I think for so many people dependent on the music that you love, like going into the history of it. Where do you fit into that history? How do you help other people? Who are the people that you want to mentor you? And taking time to really, to really know and love the music. I think the experience for a DJ that's really like, I just wanna be on stage in front of people and it's all about feeding my ego. There is a place for you, but you get, it's a different relationship that you have to it. And if you really want a deep, meaningful relationship with it, going back into the history, going like really learning about the storytelling and the way stories are told within your genre of music is really important and really perfecting, really perfecting it. Like you don't have to be perfect. You will never be perfect. And I always tell new DJs, just get out there and DJ in front of people. Like I'm not like you have to stay in your bedroom until you are this perfect DJ. Like there is something to be said about going out and sucking in front of people as well. Um, but taking the time to really respect where you came from like in any other industry most of the time you do have to learn the history of it like i went to film school i had to learn the history of film and all different parts it's different genres in film and i think the same thing you know happens in music and if you're going to produce music the sounds where they came from if you're sampling you know what you're sampling who were the original artists who are the people that you want to attribute the music to all of that is important and i feel like that's another thing that has changed nowadays where we can have those conversations like like i said i've really been making an effort to like how do we get more females on the the record label because there was a long time where people were just making music and they were not they were using samples and not necessarily giving the original car uh, artists the credit and there are people that still do that and I have still struggled with it how do you give them the credit what is the best way to credit them and I've even noticed there were things in some of the distribution sites that didn't exist before where like if you're sampling you put in the name of the person you're sampling so I think in ways it's beginning to like ripple out um, but yeah especially in electronic music where it's so easy with a computer to just kind of take from anything it's like well how do we do that in a way that is respectful to everyone? Because I do believe that we can take things as artists and we can sample them and we can make them and you have this like really collaborative art form that comes out of that, but it's like not collaborative if you're just taking from others. <laughs> so how do we make it a more collaborative experience? I don't actually realize I've kind of gone off, so I hope this answered your question, but- It did, it yeah, just, no, okay. and more. <laughs> No, this is awesome. <laughs> it's it's a lot of the things I've been thinking about and how can I do better? Because I say all that and I also want to say that I'm not perfect at it. And I've just been really, as we've been stuck at home over COVID, really mulling around in my mind, like, how do I move forward? Because I wasn't thinking about any of those things mm. before, you know. So if you could talk to your 10 year old self today, what would you tell her? Well, she really wanted to be a singer and uh, I have like been now recording my voice and putting it as like background vocals and stuff that I'm making. So I just would tell her that, you know, I think she got to a point where she's like, well, I don't look like the typical singer, so I could never be a singer and kind of just like went and did something else. And so maybe I would have told her I was like, I guess things ended up the way they were supposed to and you are going to get to be a singer. So you can do anything. I know that sounds so cheesy, but I just thought the whole world, if you didn't look a certain way, if you didn't sound a certain way, there were all these reasons that I couldn't do what I really wanted to do that I feel like now my like 40 year old self is just like, but all of that's so preposterous. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> all of that. Yeah, exactly. Everybody else fed that it don't feed, feed yourself with your heart, not what everybody else is saying. You yeah. Know? Feed your soul. When times got difficult in DJing, you mentioned you had some kind of dark moments. Um, what kept you motivated to stay facing forward, like to keep doing the thing? I mean, I think part of it was just to prove people wrong. I mean, 
there were there were times that people would either ins- maybe they didn't like the type of music I played or maybe they didn't think I was a good DJ and you know I don't want to say that you have to like prove yourself to everybody but I did feel this like weird onus on me that I had to like prove myself because I was a female that I had to like prove that I could do it that what those people said didn't didn't matter and you know I look back and I'm like you know what they said didn't matter but there is this part of me that's like I wanted to get out there and be like you know what people can talk about you they can talk shit about you they can say whatever you want and I still get up and I do something that I love and I won't let you know I won't let all this urge to make everybody like me and be perfect for everybody stop me from doing something that I really love. Because I think sometimes people get out there and they say things and they are really like, you know, for whatever reasons, because it's usually something personal to them. You know, they say things, they want to break people. They want to feel like what they say matters. And because of that, you know, they're steering, they're gatekeepers of a certain world. And I sort of wanted to say fuck it to all those gates you know and just kick them all down and I had for whatever reason in my personality I had this like appetite to just keep doing that to be like I can do things that people said that I couldn't you know (laughs) and that kind of motivated me more (laughs) to do them um but you know that didn't mean there were moments that I wasn't just like oh it's over right now you know this door is shut to me or oh you know, maybe I'm, you know, maybe it's not going to happen for me. And, you know, in some ways, you know, there's like a certain scene that I'm, I'm in that I have never been able to bust out of, you know, and I wonder now I'm kind of like, well, you never know what's going to happen. As when I was younger, I had definitely had more moments of like, this is the end or, you know, maybe that person is right. And I had either friends around me or my own kind of like self preservation that was just like no I'm gonna get out there and I'm gonna do it because I love doing it you know my mother actually I had a boyfriend that didn't want me to DJ at one point and I thought my mother was gonna be so mad when we broke up because she really liked him and then I just remember her going oh why would you want to date someone like that that told you that you couldn't do the thing that you love and you know it wasn't stopping me I was like no I am gonna do these things but I think about that moment too like just in other times in my life like why would I stop doing these things that I love just because somebody else didn't like it or this person didn't want to let me in or book me for that. And I've, it's brought a lot of self reflection and moments to really look at, okay, what am I feeling and how do I move through this? I'm actually thankful for a lot of those people now, because like I said, I was like, okay, well, I will be the best DJ then, you know, try me. (laughs) Does it, does it move the goalpost? for you like have you moved your own so let me rephrase that when you figure out the value of your own self-worth and other people's opinions maybe matter a little bit less does it change what the goalpost looks like you know I would have to say that almost I've it's almost like the goalpost has sort of like gone away like I now I'm just much more comfortable with being like I don't ever know what's going to happen because I have been so surprised places that I thought would never be open to me. Suddenly I got booked there music that I thought I was never going to be able to make. Suddenly I made charting. Okay. Well, how do I get, you know, am I going to be able to chart? And then suddenly I charted, you know, making music and it charted on Beatport and things like that. So like the goalpost in a way has sort of gone away because I have a lot more enjoyment around it when I'm not so worried about what other people are saying or what other people expect. And I feel like I kind of always know this, you know, I'll have these like things where I'm like, I have to have this and until I have this. And then it's always the moment that I don't care about it so much that I attain it. And it's always annoys me because I know that in the moment You know, I know that in the moment, I'm just like, as soon as I let go of it, I know that it will happen. Um, It's a lot more fun for me now not to have so many of those. Do I face disappointment? Yes, of course, we all have like moments of disappointment. I definitely feel like it's it's less long lasting now because I haven't attached as much of my like the self-worth and things like that to it. I like came to a point where I just enjoyed it. And when I enjoyed it more was when a lot more of the things that I wanted actually started to happen. Enjoying it, meaning that I wasn't so like 
hooked on these like goalposts as some measure of how good I am. Fascinating how that works, isn't it? And yet so incredibly frustrating. <laughs> it's very frustrating because it doesn't, you can't get there in the moment that you want to be there. I mean, I, I think that just the rest of my life, I don't know if it's getting older. I don't know if it's like my spiritual practice, all those things that have like kind of trained me to like let go a little bit. But in the moment when there's a big disappointment, you know, I guess that is one thing I would say to people if it's something they want to do, like there will be so many disappointments and it's kind of getting okay with that. Like disappointment isn't, not getting what you want isn't the worst thing because a lot of the times I didn't get what I wanted. There are other things that I didn't even know that came up. And I feel like that's in everybody in all aspects of our lives. <laughs> it helps, but I've gotten better at kind of like working through, working through that and reminding myself that I don't actually know what's gonna happen next. I can have a goalpost and sometimes I get way more than that and sometimes less, like it's, it's not as helpful to focus on it you know and at the same time it was helpful it's like a weird paradox that happens it was helpful because I am glad that I really like you know worked and worked and worked at getting good and like put a lot of effort into it I'm glad that I did that and at the same time I'm like some of the time I was doing that I was miserable because I was like I will just prove to this person you know so it's it's life is weird in that way so you will oscillate back and forth between those two things and you're not doing anything wrong that's sort of just part of it <laughs> yeah yeah no that makes perfect sense to me <laughs> so if someone was watching this and wanted to follow a similar career path for you like become a successful dj um you kind of answered this but i'll ask again what do you believe is the most important skill, piece of education um, that you need or that girls and women in particular might need to be successful and thrive in the industry? Well, it's hard because there's different, it's hard to answer this question. There's different aspects of what's the most important thing because I think there is the technology. So there's the technical aspect of just learning, physically how to do it, practicing, learning how to do it. And that is important. It is important to do that and learn how to do it because depending on where you're going, you need to know the like technical part of it. Is it the most important? Because I would also say learning to just be present so that you can tap into that, that when you're there, when you're with a crowd and you can feel what the crowd wants and then you have that, develop that relationship with them. So learning to just to be present in that moment. So you're not like, oh, that's part of why the technical part is so important because once you just know that you don't have to think about it so much and you can get into this like this feeling place um and then there's like the business aspect of it if you want to be successful at it there is like how do you do your social media you know running all of that posting mixes and unfortunately we live in a world i say unfortunately because a lot of djs are just like i hate doing this but i don't necessarily mind it so much um you know how do you take here's my DJing, here are my gigs, how do I share my story with people in a way that, you know, they, I always say part of it is having investing, people are investing in you, they want to see your success. Um, and then some of it just comes down to magic, you know, people say, oh, it's who you know, it's being in the right place at the right time, there is this magic aspect of it. But if you're just getting started, just start with learning how to use whatever you're going to use, whether that's your computer, whether it's the CDJs, people are playing vinyl again now, learning your actual craft, starting there. And then as you learn the craft and you become more comfortable with that, then you start to learn how to connect with the crowd. For me, that's such a big part. I know there are other DJs that everything is planned and maybe they don't. But for me, there's just this really big aspect that's just about being in the moment with the crowd. Sometimes you make eye contact with you, with people. Sometimes you don't, but you start to feel the energy. And that's when you know, oh, I need to bring the music up. Oh, I need to take it down. I wish it was a really simple equation, but so much of it is about learning to be there, to be right there where it's happening and feeling into what the people that are dancing want in that moment and what, what your role, like I almost look at it, it's, it is being a performer, 
but you're also kind of being in service to the people there. You're kind of there. I don't take requests, I will say that, but you are there to create a vibe. You know, I always tell people, no requests. I have a shirt that says no requests, <laughs> but you are there to create a vibe. And if you're going to be a no request DJ like me, you got to feel into what's going on and feel into what's happening and learn how to connect with a crowd. And that's something that just comes from doing it. That's why I always tell new DJs, even if you're nervous, even if you don't mix perfectly, just start getting used to getting out there in front of people. Because when you get out there in front of people, it's also very different than when you're at home and in your living room or in your bedroom or wherever you're practicing. And all these things start to come into play. You might get nervous. Uh, there might be people that have an argument to the side of you or you're passing drinks. There's all these things that start to happen and learning just how to be in that space and how to you know, keep doing what you're doing, how to connect with people, how to still keep the vibe going when there's all these things happening. And that just comes with practice. So. If you really want to be a DJ, you know, you do just have to start doing it in front of people. And usually that is before you are perfect at it. Um, and then, you know, if there's parties that you like, if there's festivals that you like, if there's events that you like, I mean, one way to get into those, to start mo meeting people, to networking people is volunteering, is, you know, going to the events of the music that you like, is meeting the people that are there, is volunteering. There's all different ways. I mean, I think that that's how I originally started meeting people. If you want to start making music, start sending the music into record labels, you know, network, meet the people in those record labels. Some ways, the only way you can do that is by sending the music. Um, if they have events like here in San Francisco, there's different labels that have label events where they showcase their DJs and their producers, you know, going, getting out, going to those things. Um, yeah, I mean, in some ways, you're kind of just like throwing everything out and everybody I've talked to has a little bit of a different journey. Yeah, but that, I mean, I feel like a lot of that could be applied to any area of expertise you know, but in particular, this is a form of art. And that's where you kind of have to let go of the like, there is no right answer to a lot of this. So <laughs> sometimes the learning process involves making mistakes. <laughs> yes. And being an artist, so much of being an artist is like, is sometimes you get swept up in a movement that's happening. There is a sound that people like or a type of artwork that people like. And so that's why I say there is a little bit that's just magic. It's about being in the right place at the right time. You can't really control everything. So you just do the best that you can. You control what you can. So you learn what you can. You start making mixes, all those things. And then some of it is just, I can't explain it. Some of it was just, I happened to be in the right place and the right person saw me, you know, there is, that is an aspect Always. too. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, and then in terms of concrete resources, so any particular websites you think are good resources or, or people that they would want to follow on social media other than you? Um, yes, of course. <laughs> <laughs> right. Like anywhere that you found to be yeah. particularly useful in your journey. Well, one, like for buying music, Beatport is where most DJs tend to get their music. And then you kind of learn slowly how to go through. There's a lot of different ways to get mu music. There's also track source. I think Juno is still around, but I always tend to find my way back to Beatport as far as finding music. Um, and that's where most of my music is released. You know, I will say as far as social media and things like that, like, Again, it goes, follow the people that you actually like their music. And a, a lot of them, you can start to see how they run their social media, what kinds of things they share. Um, so there are people that I could recommend, but I feel like those are just people that I like. Like, I feel like, like Dirty Bird does a great job at showcasing all their artists. And then they also bring on tons of new artists. And so that's one thing I really appreciate about them and watching them is that not only are their events and everything, the way they do it amazing, but I discover like new people and I've seen them make a lot of new people's career. Um, that's definitely for people that are more into like tech house and stuff like that. They have some deep house too, uh, but just watching them, especially if you wanna watch how a business or a brand is run, they do a really amazing job. Um, there are people that I follow for production that I find to be really helpful if you're trying to produce music. Um, there is a YouTube called Zen World, 
and the guy that does the music production whenever i've gotten lost i have like gone on there and found a ton about a music production i've also there's a group called i think it's io music academy uh that i've done like a few of their like on online courses i think they do djing as well uh, but i know they definitely do production for people that are interested in production and then i know for djs i think scratch academy is still around where lots of people go and learn to dj um it's called scratch yeah, academy I, huh? I believe yeah i feel like i should look it up just so <laughs> i mean i love it, it. that's if that's what it's called that's awesome scratch dj academy yeah i got it right yeah so i know that people have done that and then io music academy is another one based out of la those are just some that i've had experiences with um the lightning in a bottle music festival it kind of grew out of la and so i've always followed them and again i find a lot of new people on there um, and i think some of these festivals that if people are really into the music a lot of people can volunteer at the festivals and you can start to see how events are run um, how art you know you can see what the artists that come through you can discover a lot of new music things like that uh, but I will say just for like the I don't necessarily follow people that are just like oh how to do the social media or things like that more most of what I'm following is people uh, watching how people do music production there's some great like if you just want to follow like great artists I have seen like more recently if you go on twitch that's another place to follow music uh, because of like live streaming, there's been a couple like really successful like female artists on there. Uh, Mary Droppins out of San Diego had like a hugely popular um, Twitch channel. What are some other good like recommendations I can think of? Because I just started following an Instagram and basically if you follow it and you're, it's for female music producers. And what they will do is as you post your things, like if you release a track or you have a show, they'll like share it and they have like a big following. They kind of share it two people which is really nice because it's specifically for females i actually found it because i was looking for resources <laughs> and i was like oh this is cool i mean that makes sense and i will say too like i said like if people want to hit me up like if people especially if they're djs that also want to learn to like produce music like that i really I really encourage anyone to hit me up basically. And like, is, if you're making house music, tech house, funky house, bass house, any of those types, like I really want to help people get through that process of finishing their music, whether that's if they need to like start from the beginning and I can help them like sign up for classes and things. I'm totally happy to direct them in the right way. If they have an unfinished track that they want me to listen to, to kind of give them notes on, that's the kind of stuff that I'm really interested in doing in my free time. Awesome. Okay. Anything else that you feel like is important to share or talk about given kind of the ebb and flow of this conversation that didn't come up or that I didn't ask that you'd like to put out there? I mean, I feel like we, I've really been wanting to talk more just about like how things have been changing for females and what that experience has kind of been like. So I feel like we did actually cover that. I just the world is kind of opening up again so we're seeing how things restart so i i actually feel like now is a really amazing time for new djs female djs because i feel like so much changed over the last year and so there's like an opportunity because we kind of went into covid people were already talking about me too but i feel like going into covid people being at home everything that happened with black lives matter i feel like the whole world is sort of ready for change and is ready to like see other people on stage, you know, other than white cisgendered men, you know? And so it is sort of an amazing time right now where there is still a lot of pushback, but I think that the world is sort of primed for change. So people that are getting started are in the middle of their journey. It's a great time to like be out there and be creative and just be a hundred percent yourself. Mm -hmm.